This is a film documentary on tuberculosis in two of the most dramatically affected countries, India and South Africa. Tuberculosis, as you know, is now the single greatest infectious disease killer on the planet, nearly two million deaths a year, more than malaria and HIV AIDS combined. And the greatest number of tuberculosis cases can be found in the global south. And unfortunately, the response of individual governments and of the international community is hopelessly inadequate. Now, we know what the responses should be. We know we need far more by way of resources and we need more drugs in the pipeline and we need much greater research and development and we need to deal aggressively with recalcitrant drug companies. And we know that we have to give more support to survivors and to community-based projects. That panoply of interventions is clear. But this, this documentary focuses in on those strains of tuberculosis which are resistant to the current regimen of drugs. Drugs which are supported by the World Health Organization and a regimen which causes, causes tremendously agonizing side effects. And yet it need not be. There are two new drugs available, bedaquiline and delaminid, drugs which have recently been discovered after 40 years of no new drugs. And they are far better tolerated by people living with TB and can save tens of thousands of lives. So for India and South Africa, MDR-TB, multi-drug resistant TB, becomes the touchstone. Thus, first we go to India. TB exists on an epic scale. India has the highest number of people living with TB in the world. The highest number of people who die. Someone in India dies every two minutes from tuberculosis. MDR-TB, the often fatal nemesis in the world of TB, is exploding in cities like Mumbai. Dr. Zarir Udwadia, a lung specialist in Mumbai, is at the forefront of addressing this MDR-TB epidemic. With courage and integrity, he has confronted the government for its failure to acknowledge the toll that MDR-TB is taking. The government doesn't like it. They've disparaged Dr. Udwadia. Happily, truth is on his side. We stop all the TB drugs. Really? One year over. Yes, one year over. That's it. Well, simple TB is so easy to treat. It's one of the most effective and cheap cost interventions. Uh, it, costs, it's, it, it costs a few dollars for me to get a patient with simple TB, right? Uh, six months of standard drugs, and uh, you can almost guarantee them a cure at the end of treatment with 99% success, provided they take the drugs properly, of course. Patient Satu has MDR, drug-resistant TB, and the standard drugs that are available have failed. We had MDR-TB initially in 2004, which was treated and cured. Then we restarted him on treatment in 2016 because he relapsed, right? And unfortunately, Putin is positive again. MDR-TB is a completely different ballpark. It's a completely different monster, so to speak. It's a different disease. Because here, uh, by virtue of your two main drugs not working, MDR, or sometimes four drugs not working, XDR, or sometimes even more, and we were the first to describe about four years ago, what we call then totally drug-resistant TB. So when you get that kind of extreme resistance, you're left clutching at straws. I felt his pain. Uh, I'd given him 21 or 22 months of the old treatment. He'd taken it religiously. He's, a, he's an honest, meticulous young man. He was actually still sputum culture positive. 500 milligrams daily injection. We need to modify his treatment, try and access some new drugs. Sadly, they're not easy to get. An ideal candidate for bedaquiline. I can only recommend it just now. And we were now starting to apply for these drugs, which he won't be given, I'm sure, in the program. Good luck. For people like Satu, there is little hope of recovery without drugs like bedaquiline. There is no question that the Indian government should urgently roll out new drugs like bedaquiline and delaminid across the country. Tens of thousands of lives would be saved. But the government bridles. 
It argues that the drugs aren't safe, they're not adequately tested. Yet this argument has been refuted by experience in a number of jurisdictions, including South Africa. Simply put, India is dragging its feet when it comes to the new drugs, and people are dying unnecessarily. To deny the drugs when they are available to people who are dying for want of them really seems to me almost criminal. In January 2017, a 17-year-old girl took the Indian government to court over its refusal to give her bedaquiline. The lawyer who took the case is Anand Grover. Although she won the case and is alive because she received the drug, the young girl's health had drastically deteriorated and she is now oxygen dependent. The case drew huge publicity, exposing the government's negligence. At that point, the government agreed to make bedaquiline available for all those who needed it. Predictably, it hasn't happened. Now, there is a very easy remedy in terms of law uh, the government can issue what is called a license, a uh, government use license, and then have generic companies making those drugs at one-tenth of the cost. The truth is that uh, these two drugs, for example, are desperately, desperately needed, and that our MDRTB problem is too huge to sweep under the carpet anymore. For those who've had to take the standard treatment options for MDR-TB, the side effects can be devastating. Nandita's eight-year struggle with TB included months of surgeries and two years of toxic pills and injections. The injections were painful and agonizing. Nandita will bear the brunt for a lifetime. When I thought I was probably done with my suffering, I woke up from a 10-minute afternoon nap to pin drop silence. I had lost my hearing because of a TB injection that was delivered to me. I mean, this was like the final nail in the coffin, to be frank. It's like everyone else everywhere in the world, we have our dreams. All of it just came crashing down because of just one bacteria sitting somewhere inside my stomach. That is not something anyone should go through. The drugs a patient is supposed to take, it's horrible to say the least. These are old drugs. Now, there haven't been any new drugs in like 40 years. I mean, this is shocking to be frank that people are not investing in creating new drugs. But what, what, when I say that, you know, there are less investments in new drugs, what does it mean for someone like me? Well, it meant that I had to give up on my hearing. I've lost count of the number of patients who come back to me cured of their TB, but stone deaf with bilateral hearing aids which don't do anything, or patients who are left on dialysis with kidney failure, or patients left with their eyesight lost, or with crippling neuropathies, with psychosis. The drugs that we have had so far are obsolete. They would not, if they went through the normal route of delivery these days, would not be accepted, would not be, would not be allowed entry. But yet we use them, we embrace them because they're all we have. The Indian health system is hopelessly unbalanced. For years, the public sector has been grossly underfunded. The private sector absolutely dominates. The vast majority of illnesses, including TB, are first treated in the private sector. The excruciating consequences of the lack of investment in public health can be seen in the national TB program. By chronically starving the public health system, and by allowing the private sector's health system to dominate, India has effectively pushed millions and millions of patients into private hands, and that comes at a great cost for a lot of patients. When I worked in the public system, most patients were not diagnosed properly because, let's face it, I was not, never trained to diagnose uh, drug-resistant TB patients. It wasn't even part of the agenda. Nobody asks them, are you experiencing any side effects related to any drugs, anything at all. They're not asked. What Indian patients do is they, they bounce between sectors. They'll start in the private, they'll try something, they won't get better, and then they'll suddenly show up in the public, or they'll start in the public, they'll be unhappy with how they were treated, and they'll go to the private. 
And then if they have MDR TB, they'll end up with a few highly qualified private doctors, um, uh, referral centers, and then they run out of money. And then they'll again they go to the public sanatorium where they eventually will die. They don't want to take the treatment because the drugs are not curing them. They're making them feel worse. Why would anyone continue? And yes, eventually they go and die somewhere. You have on one side public health care system that is weak, that is crumbling, that, is th that, that needs an urgent revamp. And on the other hand, you have swanky private health care system, but at the cost of literally fleecing you and pushing you into poverty. So you are actually left with two choices where you don't have a choice at all. We also know that private practitioners mix and match antibiotics when, when they think someone is not getting better. They'll throw an additional quinolone. They don't know what they're doing. They effectively are known to generate drug resistance. Private qualified doctors is where drug resistance is emerging from India. In March of this year, Prime Minister Modi, at a Stop TB Partnership meeting in Delhi, reconfirmed the pledge made initially by his Minister of Health to end TB by 2025. Tuberculosis and HIV. I am happy to share with you that uh, it has been halted and now reversed. It's a bold pledge, but in the minds of many experts, it's entirely unrealistic. The government is moving incrementally on TB, but nowhere at the speed necessary to achieve the 2025 objective and more without dedicating the necessary resources. There are estimated to be a million people missing from the statistics, none of them receiving diagnosis, treatment or care. Fewer than 1,000 are on bedaquiline and delaminate when it's estimated that 147,000 have MDR-TB. Sounds to me a bit like uh, an election slogan, rhetoric, but I think uh, it, it, is, it is a promise that they just cannot keep. And believe me, I'm more of an optimist than a pessimist generally in life, but here I, uh, I, I am convinced that uh, TB will not be eliminated in my lifetime. MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, plays a key role in responding to the MDR crisis. But they are completely overwhelmed by the numbers actually turning patients away. They have moved heaven and earth to get supplies of bedaquiline and delaminate, but it's never enough. The biggest challenge that I feel is that we have drugs for a limited number of patients, but we don't have drugs for everyone. And there are so many patients who need the new drugs. That's one big challenge. But can't you choose? Ah, that's, that's really tough. We, none of us, none of the doctors on the team like choosing. We hate that procedure. When we have to sit and discuss patients and we have to choose amongst those patients, it's hell for everyone. 18-year-old Pooja needed the new drugs. She'd had years of misdiagnosis and was told she might die. She'd faced dreadful stigma. Even her father refused to pay for her treatments. Initially, when I was severely ill, I mostly used to stay at home, because of which my sister got infected with TB. My father then asked me to shift to another room. For the past two years, I've been living in a separate room alone and all by myself. I live alone, cook for myself, and do everything all by myself. Earlier, even the neighbors reproached and castigated me, every time asking and chiding me to always just stay inside the house. Now, as I have started recovering, their behavior towards me has changed. They talk to me nicely. When I was severely ill, I was discriminated against and victimized. But in Pooja's case, as in so many others, medicines are not enough. The importance of trained counselors is also indispensable to recovery. Just imagine the plight of people who come from a certain socioeconomic background, where in talking about your issues and talking about your emotional problems, your mental health issues, is considered luxury in a country like India. It would be so difficult for them. And that's how it motivated me to start working with patients and their problems and their issues and help them go through the treatment that they're going through. Sufyan is being tested because his father, Hanif, has had MDR-TB. He had run the gamut of clinics without success until he arrived at MSF. 
I would have died if I had not got this medicine, bedaquiline and delemonid. I would not have been alive in this world any longer. Fully half the residents of Mumbai live in slums just like Hanif and his family. Living in such overcrowded conditions is a sure route to TB. TB is really a social disease. If you look at where patients live, how they live, even if we treat them, the possibility of getting the infection again, and I'm not taking, uh, talking about relapse, I'm talking about getting the infection again in the same patient. That's a big challenge because they cannot really move, can they? They've already given all their money to treat this disease. This is where they have to live. This is where they have to stay. <laughs> Poverty uh, and overpopulation. Living so close to each other. Not having enough to eat. <laughs> Hanif is cured. Now he's starting work again, hoping to offer his children a better life. The new drugs work. That's what I would say. We've had culture conversions and we have patients who are gaining weight, who are improving. We've even had patients who've completed the treatment and they've cured. You know, they don't have TB anymore. Again, the question is, when are we getting them for everyone else? Yeah. If we can just get the new drugs, that would be really great. And now we turn to South Africa, an excellent juxtaposition with India. South Africa faces a particular problem, and that is the level of co-infection between TB and HIV and AIDS. In fact, the co-infection levels are so high that the government of South Africa has determined that everyone with TB should take an HIV test, and everyone with HIV should take a TB test. And in fact, in, in the year uh, 2016, fully 96% of the people diagnosed with tuberculosis knew their HIV status. Quite extraordinary. And South Africa also employs the best diagnostic device currently available, Gene Expert, it's called, and it responds very carefully to the use of the new drugs, bedaquiline and delaminate. So South Africa is a jurisdiction which is worthy of emulation. Thus, we turn to it now. Here in Kailicha, a settlement outside Cape Town, Goodman Makanda has had better luck than some of his counterparts in India, but only after an agonizing journey. Diagnosed with MDRTB, he's been ill for four unrelieved years. When the standard treatment failed, he became the first person in South Africa to receive bedaquilin and delaminid. I was just coming from work and then I just coughed blood. I was not afraid because I don't know what's happening because what I believe in our culture, if you coughing blood, you can be uh, say witchcraft, someone bewitch you. Goodman shares this bedroom with his brother. His story speaks to the decision of South Africa to roll out the new drug bedaquilin on a selective basis. His four years of treatment were overseen by Dr. Jennifer Furin. I think one of the things that really hampers the global approach to TB is um, the people who make the decisions about who should get access to medicines don't ever have the opportunity of sitting face to face uh, with someone whose life is on the line. When you see someone like Goodman who's personally gone through so much and he's willing to take the next step forward, how can the rest of us not be? Goodman was first put on the World Health Organization's approved treatment plan for MDR-TB. That meant brutally painful injections and a daily dose of 15 pills with toxic side effects, including hearing loss, as we saw in India. It was Dr. Furin who had to tell Goodman that his treatment had failed. He was in steep decline. I was really concerned about what we were going to be able to offer him medically. The field of drug-resistant TB treatment has been stagnant for decades. They told me it's no longer MDR now, it's pre-XDR. So now this TB is getting worse than the one they told me, which means I'm going to die. We had two new drugs then that were available, bedaquiline and delaminid but they were only theoretically available. I said to him, There's, there is a new drug that um, nobody 
in South Africa has gotten before, but I'd like to try to get it for you. And he said, okay. And thus began our journey together as a doctor feeling very compelled to fight because he was so compelled to fight. We'll return to Goodman, but it's worth noting that while he was taking the new drugs, the Department of Health began rolling Bedaquilin out across the country. TB, we're treating 300,000 people, and 60% of people on Bedaquilin are in South Africa. So if you've got such a big pandemic, especially the HIV pandemic, which feeds the TB... And vice versa, yeah. And, yes, and vice versa, they feed into each other. It becomes something out of this world. In South Africa, in crowded townships like Kailicha, HIV prevalence and TB rates are among the highest in the world. Once again, we encounter an innovative project, this time focusing on decentralizing responses to MDR-TB. The project sees 200 patients a year, and at the core of decentralization lies the role of indispensable community health workers. These workers from TB HIV care visit people who are being treated for TB in their homes. You will ask how many people are living in the house. Then you will ask person by person if you have any TB symptoms. Now one by one, that is mm. taking time. Mm. Then we focus more on children that are under five years and HIV positive people and the people that are over 60. Does the social worker bring food if needed? No, we've got a social grant, but they do have uh, parcels. We can walk. We can walk. We can walk. We can walk. To work at community level means that those with TB can stay close to their families instead of being confined in distant sanitariums. It's good to meet you. Thank you for letting us come. Do you have food? Are you okay for food? That's a problem. That's a problem I, I've got. So he has to apply for a social grant yes. to get the food. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Like today, I mean, I mean, I woke up with nothing about that, uh, that, all that powder. Precious, do you feel you're being well looked after by the community by the health workers? They visit me. It's like now I've got another mother. You know, my mother passed away a long time ago, so now I've got other people. But, but now she has reappeared, Sorry. sitting beside me. <laughs> as important as the drugs are, we need more than medicines for TB. Nutritious food is vital. Without decent food, it's almost impossible to overcome the disease. As you've seen, the government offers a grant for food, but the application process is slow. Odwa's mother has come to stay with him because he's trying to overcome TB. He was employed at a fertilizer plant, but is now too sick to work. If I come, maybe there is no food. They try to refer, to, 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 to talk to my supervisor. Odwa has extra pulmonary TB. That means it isn't lodged in his lungs alone. What is not often known is that TB can attack any organ of the body. In this case, it's spread to Odwa's spine. Painful surgery has inserted steel rods in his back. What about your tablets, medication, medication? Yeah. Yes, that every month. His mother makes sure that he's taken all the tablets. I take five of these every day and one of these. You must say thanks to your mother for your support. So how is your back now? It's much better, I can sleep. The Department of Health now employs community health workers nationwide. Understandably, their work is in high demand. As part of our, our fight against TB, we, we identified the, the, the most vulnerable. We try to follow the family and screen, especially the children. We try to do a follow-up, and that's where community health workers come in. So the, the community health workers become a backbone of primary health care. The primary health care becomes the heartbeat of the health care system. TB in children is terribly sad and inescapable. As always, children are on the bottom rung of the ladder of public concern. In South Africa, the rates of TB infection in children and adolescents resemble those reported in Europe a century ago. There are countless children who go undiagnosed. TB is grossly underestimated. Worse, 
the highest risk of contracting HIV is also in adolescence. So an infant has the highest risk, and then also if you are HIV positive or malnourished, there's also a higher risk of getting disease. And these are the really, really so most severe cases that we often don't know about. And if that child dies, that's a TB death that we don't know about. Some recent estimates have shown that actually childhood TB is probably a really important cause of child mortality globally. Alas, children also get MDR-TB. While it is true that 90% of children treated with the existing array of standard MDR drugs are cured, they have to endure the terrible treatment regimen with which we are familiar. Irreversible hearing loss occurs in at least a quarter of all children treated with these drugs. Some have extrapulmonary TB. The worst is TB meningitis that attacks the brain. It can leave children permanently physically disabled and cognitively impaired. Are you still getting injections? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> do, you, do, you remember, do you remember the injections? They weren't nice, were they? Taku is six, and like many children, her MDR-TB was not diagnosed until long after it had spread to her spine. You see the way she's walking? Yes. They said it's a hip problem, but no one noticed it to us TB. She's still in treatment here. Her mother works and can only visit once a month. It was extremely dangerous, but now I have hope and I really like it. There's a big, 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 big change. Really? Ah. Big change, I'm telling you. She was like a skeleton, you can put it in a plastic bag, but now you see this big mama. It's a good big now. It's big mama now. Bye. Can children respond to bedacolin and bilaminin? Well, I mean, the studies are just starting, so we don't know for sure, but there's no reason to expect they wouldn't respond as well. We need to know how to dose them appropriately in young children and children of all ages. The only way to know that is actually to do studies in them um, with the new drugs. Did you get the injections in the hospital? Yes, I did. I, did. I got it every day, and um, only the day that I didn't get it was Sunday. I didn't get it Sunday, I only got it. They, they let you oh, off on Sunday? Yes. <laughs> Kiara. 13 years old, is the fourth member of her family to get MDR-TB. How many tablets did you take each day? I took 15. <laughs> How many? 15 tablets. There's no child-friendly formulations, so we're using adult tablets that are split and crushed. And they're exactly what we did this is HIV. Exactly. Yeah. And they're, they're very poorly palatable, and this is a major issue for families and children. We ran into a lot of uh, anxiety about children and TB. Oh, yes. particularly MDR. It's, it's extremely worrying, and diagnosing TB in children is, just, is notoriously difficult, even for the most experienced specialist. But the Department of Health is working on this and slowly moving forward. One of the, the, the main challenges being um, administration of uh, tablets, uh, which are crushed, mixed with water or bacteria. It's like the old days of HIV. Exactly, yeah. old days. So what what we're trying to do now is to introduce a pediatric formulation for, for drug resistant tuberculosis. Um, so so that's something that is in the in the pipeline. The Department of Health has also been struggling with the World Health Organization's guidelines for standard treatment for MDR TB. It, it would have been much better to have an in, a, a regimen without an injectable, but you have to go through these processes. Uh, you have to convince the expert committees, guideline committees, and uh, so yes, that's, those are challenges. In June of 2018, Dr. Njeka's views prevailed the government of South Africa decided to provide bedaquiline for everyone with MDR-TB. The hated injections would no longer be needed. South Africa thus courageously rejects WHO's tentative guidance on bedaquiline, guidance tempered by the search for scientific perfection. 
It reminds me of exactly the same policies towards antiretrovirals for HIV. People died while science danced on the head of the proverbial pin. Nevertheless, the conditions for a continued TB epidemic in South Africa are ripe. All the social determinants of health are failing. Poverty, housing, overcrowding, unemployment in a country that is already deemed the most unequal in the world. To be fair, South Africa, certainly the Department of Health, is aware of what must be done to overcome tuberculosis. And more than almost any other regime, they're trying. And whatever their imperfections, and those imperfections are admitted, South Africa is still a model for almost all other jurisdictions. Voices like that of 29-year-old Sisypho are a testament to the lives that can be saved if the world takes notice. Do you know which drugs you were taking? Uh, it's, they give it beta coolant and uh, delaminate. And you're feeling better? Yes, much better. It's my first time to talk like this. <laughs> well, we... Uh, okay, come, let me hike you. <laughs> What you need in this TB thing is a support system. If there's no support system, it's not easy. It's a TB is a challenge by its own. Medication, that is another challenge. So if you don't, you have a lack of support, you can't make it. Such a, these tears are spoiling this makeup. Okay. <laughs> no, I know you're so brave. Along with Zizifo, is Goodman. He's finally better. But he should never have had to endure the hell of that four-year journey. I want to be a TP advocate. We will take our black cards, stand in front, fighting for the better treatment. If we stand up and say enough is enough, this one, two, three must be done. Goodman's story is a triumph, no question. But it also speaks to the vast array of injustice that haunts the Global South. The sustainable development goal of health for all will never be reached so long as science and resources are the privilege of the Global North. Tuberculosis is the touchstone. If we succeed, it will be a victory for the ages.